Hello and welcome to our Encore presentation of MASH Roadside Barriers, Design Lessons Learned. I'm Richard Stepp, Standard Plans Engineer at FDOT Central Office in Tallahassee, and I'll be your presenter today. Following the FDOT Symposium in Orlando, we received feedback that some of our information given in our Lessons Learned session was helpful for designers and that we should make this session available as a video so that others can see it at their convenience. In the past few years, we've done a pretty substantial development to FDOT Design Manual Section 215. That's for roadside safety, uh, covers our roadside barriers. We've redeveloped uh, standard plans for guardrail, standard plans for concrete single slope barrier, peer protection barrier, even the crash cushions, um, all with the goal of providing some improved clarity for user friendliness to get the best designs possible statewide. And also that moves the department in the direction of AASHTO MASH compliance, which enables the roadside barriers to handle larger vehicles on our roadways. And so to see how designers were understanding all of these new materials, we've recently been performing QARs, quality assurance reviews on roadway plan sets in the districts. And so this session came about as a result of our quality assurance reviews. This experience gives us the opportunity to provide some education and feedback to designers on uh, what central office is looking for and expecting to see on uh, state projects. And so with that, we'll get into talking about some of the barriers and exactly what it was that we were looking at. And so this session today will focus on guardrail, uh, standard plans index 536-001, concrete barrier, which is index 521-001, and then peer protection barrier 521-002. We're gonna focus primarily on guardrail today, touch really lightly on concrete barrier and uh, peer protection barrier. And so to understand general design and how our QARs worked uh, for the districts, uh, we had to define what was the governing policy, the governing criteria for design. And so essentially the first manual that you'd be looking at is the FDOT design manual. That's the first place you go to determine uh, the fundamentals um, if you're deciding whether or not to use roadside barrier, or which type of roadside barrier to use. And the FDOT design manual could apply to multiple standards. So it's a little bit higher level in that regard. The next place you would wanna look is the FDOT standard plans. And so this has all of the construction and all the contractor requirements. And the idea is to have all the drawings and details correspond correctly to what is in your project specific contract plans. And so in order to do that, you do have to see what's drawn in the standard plans and make sure everything works correctly together. All the dimensions are correct. All the cross slopes are the same and things like that. Uh, the third place you look is in the standard plans instructions, call them the SPIs for short. If you go on the website, it's just immediately adjacent to the standard plans themselves. And so uh, this is a good place to start if you're using a, a standard plan, especially for the first time. And then that provides designers with information that's just unique to that particular standard. So the SPI for 536001 would focus only on guardrail as opposed to the FDM, which focuses on multiple standards. Lastly, uh, the design is governed by standard specifications and the corresponding pay items and specifications is obviously the contract document that ties all the other documents together and then also provide some basics, um, material requirements and tolerances and, and things of that nature. That's the last place you would look. And so basically this session is set up so that I'm going to pose a question and then just give a moment to think about it and then I'll go ahead and provide the answers. And so in the symposium session in Orlando, when I asked these questions, um, we had some great feedback from engineers in the audience. But for this case, it's a webinar, so I will start to consider these questions just rhetorical, just as a jumping off point to get into discussing some of the issues that we see. And so for this case, I'm showing some guardrail. Luckily, it looks like this photo is pretty old. I know it's from a different state, but it, but it is good to understand uh, just in case we, we might see similar issues in Florida. Uh, we might want to avoid these things. And so it looks like we have a slope break. It's a little bit in front of the post there. Uh, might be pretty steep. So any issues here? The answer is yes. Looks like the front slope is too steep. Uh, we'll get into the exact requirements in a moment. The slope break is likely too close to the post. Looks like it's a little bit in front of the post in this case. And so from our standard, you can see that the front slope needs to be one to two max. 
Going back here, looks a little closer to one to one. So that is, it is pretty steep, uh, just eyeballing it. That would be something you'd want to investigate. And then the slope break must be two feet behind the post. And so in this case, it's not. Now we do have one case where the slope break doesn't have to be two feet behind the post. And that would be if a deep post is called for, the slope break may be located at the center line of the post. And so you can see these details are straight from our standard plans, shows the slope break right at the center line of the post. If you have project constraints or right of way restraints, uh, this might be the best option for you. Um, we've actually just recently had a question that was a project that had, was an ideal candidate for this where um, they were very pressed on space. And so they successfully used a deep post with a one to two slope behind it. And then still the front slope needs to be one to two regardless of deep post or not. And then note when you use this, you have to call it out separately. It has a, its own unique pay item. So the contractor knows he has to do something different. We have these detailed specifically separately from standard posts. And then these are called deep posts and you'll find them in our standards. Okay, so now we're looking at a shoulder widening and this will be the first time you see my drawing. And so rather than show actual project plan sets, which sometimes is interesting, I just went ahead and redrew it and then that way we can put the attention on my drawings, you know, maybe laughing at my drawings. But the idea is that now we're focused on only a particular issue and avoiding all the other clutter so we can get right to the issue that we're trying to discuss. And so that's why I made some uh, separate drawings just for this. And so in this case, we have the traffic coming from right to left here. The little arrows indicate direction of traffic, which is good. We have an approach terminal on the approach side. It looks like it's called out properly. And then the trailing anchorage is downstream, which is good. So that's called out nicely. Looks like they have a taper to accommodate the shoulder widening. And so the question would be, what possible issues does this have? Does it have an issue? So the answer is yes. The taper rate requirement is violated. I called out a station and offset and a station and offset. For this case, it looks like you're basically doing a lateral offset of about six feet between 50 to 56 over a little over, you know, 12 and a half feet. So that's really close to a one to two taper rate, which really uh, is pretty extreme. And so the issue you have with that is that guardrail in general is designed to run parallel to the roadway. You want to reduce angle of impact whenever possible. Guardrail is crash tested with specific uh, impact angles, assuming the original placement of guardrail is parallel to the roadway. And so you want to be really careful with something like this because a vehicle if it were to hit that head on, it'd be almost a perpendicular impact. Uh, it could flip the vehicle or the vehicle would just punch right through into oncoming traffic or the hazard behind it. And so it's just not a safe design. It's even a little bit worse than a point hazard because even if vehicle impacted a little bit uh, upstream of this, it would kind of slide along the guardrail and ended up hitting a snag point. And so there's a wide catch area. And so you want to avoid steep taper rates uh, at all costs. And so our standard plans instructions give that for design speed less than or equal to 45 miles per hour, you need a one to 10 max taper rate. For design speed greater than 45 miles per hour, it requires a one to 15 max. And so you can find that SPI part I. Okay, so the next issue that showed up in a few plan sets is the case where you're going from single face guardrail and then the double face guardrail. And so I think engineers were not clear on how to detail this out or what to call out. And so in this case, it looks like uh, they called out a trailing anchorage on one side and then the single face guardrail on the other. And so the end single face guardrail is here, begin double face guardrails at the same post location. And so the question is, are there any issues here? Does anybody identify anything? And the answer is yes. The trailing anchorage standard is not used here. It's just basically not detailed this way, which I'll show in a moment. The guardrail single face doesn't continue with a trailing anchorage in any standard plans drawing. And there's certain reasons for that. And so you don't need a full trailing anchorage complete with breakaway posts at this location. The ribbon strength is already developed. So that's not required. So essentially the details are just not compatible. And so the idea as a designer creating your roadway plan sets is to not really invent or create any type of new type of guardrail installation that isn't detailed out or considered crashworthy. 
you need to really follow the standards and, and draw things exactly the way they're shown in the standards. And so there's no drawing that shows a continuation of single-faced guardrail coming out of any one of these trailing anchorages. Here, here's the double-faced version. This buffer end unit simply couldn't work if there was a continuation of guardrail. And more importantly, there are breakaway posts which conflict with standard guardrail. And then also for the single-faced version, there's clearly no offset blocks. And so this wouldn't work with the struts. It wouldn't work with the steel tube foundation. And so the bottom line is you don't need to call out a trailing anchorage when you're going from single to double-faced guardrail. The ribbon strength is already developed. And so going back here, this would be what the solution looks like. You just simply call out end single face guardrail, begin double face guardrail. There will be a little flared end unit on there just to shield off the backside uh, to not have that exposed metal point on the end. And you just call out the begin end of guardrail. And this is included in the general guardrail pay item, the, the flared end unit. And in the next year's ebook in the standard plans, we actually will now just show a detail that shows single face to double face and then shows the flared end unit. Currently, this detail is shown on crossover guardrail, but we didn't think that designers were seeing it. And so we'll go ahead and just have a specific drawing that shows single to double face, and then that'll take care of that one. For CRT systems, which is called control release terminal, this is basically our, our radial system that's currently shown in our standard plans. This is typically installed if you have basically the principal roadway direction is coming left to right as shown by the indication of traffic by this arrow. And you're trying to shield some type of hazard or drop off back here. And you're basically rounding the corner where there happens to be a side street or a driveway. And so we'll go ahead and ask if anybody sees any issues here. One thing that is good, it looks like they called out, you know, begin guardrail, begin CRT at the same post. And so that's good. The begin guardrail is at post one. They called out the start of the radius, which is helpful for contractors. You call out the radius. Uh, so that's all good. So asking the question, are there any issues here? Uh, the answer is yes. So the first issue is the obstruction is in the clear area limit per the standard plans. The standard plans, which I'll show in a moment, show a clear area where there can be no above ground obstructions. And so this mast arm support looks to violate that. The vehicle coming left to right basically is going to impact this at nearly a 90 degree angle if it you know was to be an errant vehicle and come off the road and the way that the crt system functions and allows for a 90 degree impact is that you have a string of breakaway posts all working together that allow a very large deflection upon impact of a vehicle to capture a vehicle at a 90 degree angle if you don't have that it's too abrupt of an impact. Uh, the guardrail will be likely to fail or flip a vehicle. And so the whole idea is to have a lot of breakaway posts and lots of deflection angle. That mast arm support would violate that. And so here you see an example uh, from another state where a hazard was placed in this clear area limit. And you can see a lot of the guardrail all just broke away. They're all breakaway posts. It's what it's supposed to do in order to absorb all that energy and capture a vehicle. Unfortunately, the above ground obstruction is placed in the way and likely the vehicle would hit that at a pretty high rate of speed. And so you're not really getting any type of shielding out of this. And so that's a, that's a flawed design that we're looking to avoid in Florida. And so this is the way the standard looks. You could see clearly defined the clear area limits. And then you have all the breakaway posts along here. This is what the standard guardrail posts look like. And so again, you wanna leave that clear 15 by 30 feet right here. The clear area is free of obstructions. You can have a fairly steep slope of one to two max, even in the clear area. Um, but the important part is to avoid the above ground obstructions. Okay, so it looks like the hazard was removed. So that's a good sign, but there's still another remaining issue. And this one's a little bit harder to spot, but we, we do see it come up in plans a lot. So we have to address it. The CRT is a kind of a fickle system. It was crash tested in a certain way. And so there's one other issue here, and that is that it requires a 25 foot linear end treatment per the standard plan. So outside of this radius, this needs to be 25 feet. Right now, 12 foot six is shown. That's important because you actually need enough standard posts lined up in order to provide ribbon strength so that all these breakaway posts can function correctly and capture a vehicle. 
if you don't have the 25 feet, basically this could all just become a breakaway system and it's not gonna capture a vehicle. And so in order for all the breakaway posts to work, it needs to be tied down correctly. Otherwise, it's basically just a gating system and it's not providing much help. So we can't have this being 12 foot six, needs to be 25 feet. And so the solution is to provide a full 25 feet as shown. And we recognize that that is a challenge but in order for a CRT system to function properly and not just be completely break away, that is pretty critical. And so we wanted to raise that point, which brings back to our other point. The main theme is to only put things in your plans exactly the way they're drawn in the standard and don't make modifications to them. They're drawn that way for a certain reason. Uh, when the specific details are given, that's the way it was crash tested. That's the way it needs to be constructed. And now, Again, we do understand project constraints a lot of times prohibit this, and sometimes there's just no solution for barrier that's gonna perform exactly the way it was during crash testing. And if you can't fit the full 25 feet, you're basically gonna to wanna to use a variation and not use CRT. And so instead you would just use general guardrail, which looks like this. It has the post and the offset block, standard posts, not breakaway posts, and you just use a standard radius, you would need a variation for that because you'd have to justify that the impact of the guardrail itself providing a buffer uh, is preferable to whatever happens to be behind it, such as a drop-off hazard or a canal hazard, something of that nature. And so the idea at that point is you're putting in guardrail almost as a last resort uh, to keep a vehicle from hitting something worse. And then the hope is if it's hopefully a lower speed facility, a vehicle would have slowed down enough so that the guardrail would just provide a nice buffer, uh, distribute the impact force, and it'd be preferable to whatever's behind it. But in general, guardrail isn't really meant to function with impacts at a 90 degree angle. And so you're just at that point doing the best you can as a designer, given your project constraints, and we want that documented. And we do realize anytime there's something that's non-standard, you may want guidance on that. And so that's why we're here in central office. So please contact central office for guidance. In upcoming standard plans instructions, we're gonna address the issue a little more extensively on how to handle when your project constraints don't allow for the standards as they're drawn, or we'll give uh, some more instruction on that uh, moving forward. But in general, you can't go wrong contacting central office if the standards uh, won't fit your unique project. Okay, so now moving along to pipe rail call outs. This is an issue we see come up uh, fairly frequently. You're basically calling out pipe rail wherever you have a sidewalk or shared use path within four feet of these guardrail posts. Uh, and the reason is if the contractor happens to use steel flange posts, those steel flanges have uh, pointed tips on the ends. And so we're trying to keep any pedestrians from being injured on those. And uh, the pipe rail provides a degree of protection along the top. And so if there's a sidewalk there, it's Good to call out pipe rail and assume that the contractor is going to use steel posts and so the question is are there any issues with the way this is called out it looks like begin guardrail and trailing anchorage is called out in the same location which is good to share a call out um, begin pipe rails call at the same location and then on the other side we have the approach terminal the end guardrail and the end pipe rail it's all together and so are there any issues here the answer is yes the pipe rail must terminate outside of the end treatments for SPI Part E and the standard plans. And so that's basically outside of what we've classified as LE and LT uh, per the standard plan. So we have these segments defined for an approach terminal and then for a trailing anchorage. And the pipe rail needs to be outside of those. And so the solution would look like this. They have their own unique callouts. And now it seems like a trivial thing to keep it outside of the approach terminals, um, but actually it's very important because we don't want to confuse the contractor with where they believe they should be placing pipe rail. Uh, approach terminals need to be installed exactly the way they're shown in the APL drawings, as close to crash test conditions as possible. And that's just an important concept in general, going back to as a designer, please only place in your plans what is shown in APL drawings or what is shown in standard plans and try not to deviate from that wherever possible because these things are crash tested and they need to perform correctly. 
The pipe rail is just basically a metal pipe. It could become a spearing hazard for vehicles if it's on the approach terminal. It needs to terminate correctly uh, the way it's shown in the details outside of the approach terminal. So it's important, keep pipe rail outside of these end treatments. Okay, so now we're moving on to rigid barrier connections and end shielding. And so we've shown some drawings. These are, are crash test scenarios of approach transition connection to rigid barrier. You see the way this works is it's you know slowly increasing rigidity as you approach the rigid barrier. So there's not an instantaneous change in rigidity that would create pocketing or a snag hazard. And so that's why these approach transition connection to rigid barriers need to be designed exactly as they're shown in the standard plans as well. It's important to follow that because they're crash tested. And so the first issue we came across a few times, probably from old habits, but we see we have this called out. We got the approach terminal here on the approach end. It's good they called out the approach transition connection. Uh, they're using our standard nomenclature from the SPI, so that's good. We've got the end of the concrete barrier here, the beginning of the guardrail is over here. And so the question is, is there any issue? The answer is yes. For newer standards, 2017-18 or after, and even since the 16-17 interim, the overlap here has really, from a guardrail measuring perspective, only been about seven and a quarter inches. And previous standards to that showed a, a big 13-foot overlap. And again, we're talking about single-face guardrail. So this 13-foot overlap, it's just no longer here. And plans moving forward should not show that overlap. And we don't want to cause any confusion with uh, contractors and what standards they should be following. And so please, whatever standards you're using, please open them up and look at the configuration. Try to emulate what's drawn there for the standards that are applicable to your plan set. Um, please don't just copy and paste from old projects because the standards are evolving. The new approach transition connection is MASH compliant. And so it's important to not confuse the contractor on that point. And we'll quickly take a look at the new standard. This is how it looks, the MASH tested version. You could see seven and a quarter inch overlap. If you want it to be that precise as a designer, because maybe something uh, way upstream, you were, you know, you had some type of uh, curb or side street and you needed the guardrail to end in a precise location, uh, you, you can account for that. Otherwise, you can just call it out right at the end of the barrier. There's a pretty large longitudinal tolerance in the specifications, about three feet. And so that should cover these few inches here and there. The precision of the guardrail design, especially longitudinally, it doesn't need to be that precise. But if you do want to account for it because you're really pressed for space at one end, then you can take a look at the standard and see where things are called out. Throughout the standards, we call out begin end guardrail station things like begin and rigid barrier station, so you could see the difference. And then these type of callouts would correspond to your plans if you wanted to get that precise. And so here's the old way of doing it. Here's the new way of doing it. You see the end of concrete barrier is pretty much the same location as the begin guardrail TL3 approach transition. All right, so now moving on to another scenario. The good news is that the callout of the begin TL3 approach transition relative to the end of the concrete barrier. It's right at the end of the concrete barrier, and so that's good. It looks like we're following the new standard now. And then you can see they have some length of guardrail. It's ended with an approach terminal, and so that's good. And so the question is, do you see any issues here? The answer is yes, the guardrail system is not long enough. And so the minimum length is the length of approach transition connection, which is LA, plus the length of end treatment, which is LE. And so you need to have that mash tested approach transition in here. You need to have that mash tested approach terminal in here. You need to provide space for both. And this one just doesn't do it. So the standards will not fit in here. You can see this whole system is, you know, about 47 feet long and that's just not gonna do it. So the minimum length for TL2 would be taking the sum of these two drawings in the standard plans. So we got LA about 21.3 feet LE 40.6 feet. The total is 62 feet. So you have to have at least 62 feet for a TL2 system, which would be 45 miles per hour and less. And so that's what this solution would look like, uh, drawn a little bit longer. Uh, once you've seen these enough, you kind of get a feel for about how long these installations need to be. And so this is what TL2 would look like.
And then for TL3, we would need to have the sum of the longer, more robust approach transition for higher speed impacts, and that's 30.6 feet long. And then the TL3 approach terminal is about 53.1 feet, and around 84 feet. Close enough, you're going to have enough room for both standards so the contractor can build it correctly. And so that's the minimum length for TL3. That's what it should look like. Another note we want to give, uh, similar to the CRT system, is that if these lengths are not possible due to limited space, consider using you know, something shorter, if maybe a crash cushion would fit, or project-specific variation to fit the best barrier system possible. And again, it's the general disclaimer is if the standards simply don't fit uh, your project, and that would come up with, you know, you have the end of a bridge, you have a canal, and then immediately you might have a driveway or a side street, a parking lot, or possibly a railroad crossing or something very close to the bridge. Those unique cases can be difficult to cover. Um, so please contact central office for assistance if you need some help using something that's non-standard, and we can try to give you some guidance on that. Okay, so our next topic that we've already covered a little bit in terms of length are the approach terminals. And so here you can see the three approach terminals that we currently have that are mash tested on the APL. We we'll keep adding to that as more and more approach terminals become available from the manufacturers. We'll show our first configuration, you know, issue that we encounter to in a set of plans and uh, thought it would provide a good lesson here. And so here we see we have a curb condition uh, and you can place approach terminals with curb conditions, so that's okay. And you got the traffic coming on the page right to left. And so you have your approach terminal and so that's appropriate called out at the end of the guardrail. And you have a flare terminal. Uh, flare terminals in the past have been used to shorten length of need. So the question is, do you see any issues uh, with this type of design? And the answer is yes. First one, flare terminals are not permitted per Rowe Design Bulletin 1802. And so the issue we have is availability of mash tested approach terminals that are flared. Companies have been able to meet mash compliance uh, with parallel terminals. It's turning out that the flared is a little bit more of a challenge. And so very few are available in the flared model and companies are still working on that. But in the meantime, so contractors have enough options. The department needs you to just install parallel terminals. And so that's the first issue with this uh, moving forward. And the second issue is that even if flare terminals were an option, which in some of these past projects they were, the problem is that for a curbed condition, the only thing shown in the standard to work with it is a parallel terminal. And the reason for that is that the terminal needs to be up close to the curb to prevent any type of uh, large influence of the curb on the vehicle prior to hitting the approach terminal. Um, in general, these are crash tested without curbs. And so the whole goal is to minimize the effect of the curb. We do know that curbs produce some vaulting of vehicles, some bouncing of vehicles. But if a barrier is placed close enough to a curb, the vehicle really doesn't have time to react to it prior to hitting the barrier. And so the idea is to get it up as close as possible. So for curb conditions, parallel terminals are required. And this could also be seen just when you look at the standard plans and you know, please follow exactly the way it's drawn in the standard plans. It only shows a parallel terminal with a curb. And so the last issue is that this raised curb was shown as a type F. And again, our idea is to minimize the effect of curb we still want to provide some water conveyance and allow for curb, but we want to minimize the effect in the area of the approach terminal and keep the vehicle on a straight and narrow path, not bouncing up and down prior to hitting the approach terminal. And so the standard plans show a type E curb and how to handle transitioning that, or it might be preferred if the entire project uses a type E. So here's how the standard plans show an approach terminal with a curb. You can see it's parallel and type E curb only, and we do explain those transitions. And so the solution would look like this, call out a parallel terminal, uh, you have your type E curb, and then you're good to go. 
All right, so we'll keep looking at an approach terminal. In this case, now we're using a parallel terminal, uh, which is good because it's the only thing available for the foreseeable future. So in this case now, we've detailed out where miscellaneous asphalt goes and where that front slope break goes. And so in general, for guardrail, we require a one to 10 slope or flatter. Uh, typically the FDM governs the slopes of the approaching pavement but we also state in the standard plans that if other conditions occur, you know, you have a one to 10 maximum slope for the performance of guardrail. And so that's how we show where the front slope is. So you're basically going in the front slope, um, something shallower than one to 10 to something steeper than one to 10. And so we show the miscellaneous asphalt is right here. We've got two feet behind the post to that slope break point, which is good. So in our standard sections for guardrail, we've got two feet behind the post in the general run. And so that's where it's supposed to be. And so that looks like it's good, it's all aligned. And so the question is, do you see any issues here? And the answer is yes. The front slope break should be six feet behind the guardrail face at post one per the standards. And so here we have post one. This is essentially continuing the two feet behind the post, which is just not sufficient. For crash test conditions, there is a large clear area around approach terminals for the approach terminal to behave the way it's supposed to and also enough space for the vehicle to stay basically level as it's making its impact and so the idea is to emulate crash test conditions also the roadside design guide is where we got the six feet behind guardrail we happen to measure from the face of guardrail in general for convenience everything is measured from face of guardrail Roadside design has something similar, which is five feet behind the post, so it's very similar. But yes, we need clear space. One to 10 slope max. The second issue is that the miscellaneous asphalt should extend 10 feet upstream of post one per the standard. So we clearly show that detailed out, extends 10 feet upstream. And the idea there is to prevent any type of erosion or any type of ruts from forming. Um, that would cause vehicle instability prior to hitting the terminal. We want to create ideal conditions as possible for this approach terminal to perform the way it's supposed to. And so we got to extend that 10 feet upstream. Again, we get that from national criteria. And so our standard looks like this. You can see that the slope break point starts to taper out so that it's now six feet behind the face of guardrail at post one. Uh, and then it starts to transition back to the standard slope break point. And then you want to extend that miscellaneous asphalt 10 feet upstream. Moving forward, we are going to put additional notes to allow for a substitute type of pavement. The bottom line is we're just looking to avoid conditions that are unpredictable. We're looking to avoid soil erosion going 10 feet uh, upstream of post one. And so if you had you know, a curb or a side street or something of that nature that was all paved, then that would actually be acceptable uh, as a replacement for this. But if this is just like a limited access facility with soil, uh, we want to prevent it from eroding away. And so that's where that pavement goes. Okay, so this is a photo from another state. You can see it's a very poor slope rate condition. First issue, of course, is this very steep slope is not shielded, um, so the length of need is probably not correct, but even not focusing on that issue, you can see looking around the approach terminal that there's almost no way that this extends properly six feet behind the approach terminal before any type of break. Any vehicle impacting this uh, would become highly unstable and start to drop, and so the approach terminal uh, likely couldn't perform as it was intended to do. And we do want to take special care to make sure that these approach terminals perform the way they're supposed to. And then, of course, you can see 10 feet upstream of post one, that drop off, and you can see a lot of erosion. And so clearly there's no pavement, which our standard would require. And so that's another issue uh, with that installation. And then here's another example of poor grading, a reason for miscellaneous asphalt. You could see in our standards, this happens to be another state. In our standards, we require miscellaneous asphalt, preventing a lot of this erosion. This particular installation, it looks like a lot of these steel tube foundations are beginning to be exposed. So if the vehicle hits this, these are breakaway posts. The undercarriage uh, might suffer a lot of a lot of scraping, a lot of issues, maybe dislodging of tires because of that steel that's sticking up out of the ground that's not supposed to be. And then upstream, 
you know, you can see you have a lot of uneven terrain and this is not an ideal condition for an approach terminal uh, to perform. And so the solution looks like this. Upstream of the approach terminal, you've got your miscellaneous asphalt extended properly and then your slope break location tapers out to the proper six feet. Okay, so now assuming our grading issues are all handled properly, we'll take a look at another scenario. So in this particular case, it looked like there was some foliage uh, located around the approach terminal. In this case, they were smaller trees, so the original designer might have thought it was acceptable, but the question is, any issues here? The answer is yes. The first issue is the trees are within the approach terminal's clear area and the standard plans. And so wherever that one to 10 is called for, the drawings don't show any type of above ground obstruction. And the intent was that that's all free and clear of above ground obstructions. And then moving forward in the standard plans, we're gonna make more specific notes explaining that in that one to 10 clear area, no above ground obstructions uh, may be left in place uh, by the contractor for the finished uh, condition. And so, Essentially, those trees violate that clear space. If you recall, it basically goes to six feet behind post one and then tapers back at a one to 10. And so this is clearly within the clear space. It's going to interfere uh, with the way that approach terminal performs. And then the second issue is the trees violate the setback for FDM table 215.42. And so these particular trees back here, even if this wasn't an approach terminal, looks to be within five feet uh, from the face of guardrail, which is just not acceptable because the guardrail requires some deflection distance. And so here's a photo showing some trees around an approach terminal. And this wouldn't uh, certainly not be acceptable uh, for a new installation. It looks like you know you extend six feet behind post one and then taper back. This tree is within that clear area, so an approaching vehicle would be likely to clip that tree, start behaving erratically prior to hitting the approach terminal. In order to have the safest performance possible of an approach terminal and public acceptance of approach terminals, even when they're placed in harm's way, we have to make sure that they perform in optimal conditions. And so having a tree here certainly wouldn't accomplish that. If a vehicle landed on top of the approach terminal, um, that's something we certainly don't want to see. And then back here, if this tree would be considered a hazard, it's actually within the location where this would be a breakaway gating portion and so a vehicle could pass right through and hit the tree or the tree itself would interfere with the performance of that approach terminal uh, with a head-on collision. And so we're trying to avoid any of those scenarios. And again, this is where the margin of the clear area needs to be. This is the limit. And we, we've uh, defined that in standards moving forward. And so now to understand the importance of this clear area limit, we went ahead and showed some YouTube videos and so allow me to go ahead and bring up that video for you. Okay, so here we have a crash test video. Uh, this happens to be an SKT terminal used for NCHRP 350. The new MASH operates in the same general way. And here we're just trying to show the importance of having a uh, clear space uh, that's available. So you can imagine if a tree or some other above ground obstruction is kind of located in this general area that we would want to have a clear area and you can just see if there might be some interference from that. And so here you can see the way this functions is by extruding the guardrail. And if there was some tree in the way, you can see how that would severely uh, interfere with this. It would basically stop the approach terminal from being driven back down the W beam, It'd cause a much more severe impact. On top of that, if it interferes with the way this W beam is extruding out of the side, W beam could end up closer to the vehicle, closer to the passengers. Uh, we want to avoid that at all costs. And so you can see the way it's crash tested, clear level terrain. This is how we want to see it also in the field and the finished construction. Okay, so here we have the longitudinal view and you can just imagine if there was a tree or above ground obstruction uh, located off to this side and how that might interfere with this impact. And so hopefully you have an idea of about how much clear space is required for this all to perform correctly. Okay, so driving the point home, we'll show the larger truck impact. And again, please leave this area free and clear of obstructions. 
You do not want it interfering with that W beam extrusion. And so from the standard plans, everything within this one to 10 slope is considered a clear area. All right, so moving on to the second issue, the tree violates the barrier setback for FDM table 215.42, as it's shown here. So this is the way we define a setback distance measured from the face of guardrail to the nearest point on the hazard. If you look at that table uh, for typical six foot three inch post spacing, you require a five foot setback. W-beam guardrail in general is considered semi-rigid barrier. The idea is that it absorbs energy upon impact. The guardrail is designed to rotate backwards, and so you need to leave sufficient clear space without any hazards to interfere with that. Okay, looking at another issue for approach terminals, the designer had an issue where there was a trail back here uh, where they wanted to keep vehicles from being able to access, basically keep the general public from using trails back here. It was partially shielded by a chain link fence. And now, so they have their basic guardrail coming off of a bridge. And then they figure, okay, well, guardrail's crash worthy. So we can put in a guardrail installation to stop the vehicles from being able to access that trail. And so the question is, are there any issues with that? And the answer is yes. Uh, the first issue is the perpendicular guardrail is not proven crash worthy here. As we know, we have very specific taper rates. And so the first issue, okay, well, there's no end treatments on the guardrail, so that wouldn't be crash worthy. It violates the taper rate requirements of the standard plans instructions, part I, uh, say big time. This is basically, you know, an infinite taper rate. Uh, it's not one to 10, not one to 15. It's, you know, just perpendicular to the traffic lane. And so you'd expect a very high angle of impact on it. And so for these reasons, basically considered a hazard and require shielding if it's within the clear zone because it's not designed like a proper barrier. And so that's the first issue. The second issue is the perpendicular guardrail is within that approach terminals clear zone that we've been talking about. Six feet behind post one, tapering back. That's basically an above ground obstruction. It's gonna interfere with the performance of that approach terminal. And so we simply can't have that. Third issue is the distance behind guardrail violates the barrier setback uh, that we just discussed a moment ago. And so you'd really require a minimum five foot setback for this, which is just not shown. And so solution one is remove that guardrail installation, which I believe was done on this project. And so that perpendicular guardrail is gone and we're free and clear and we're okay. It doesn't really solve the engineer's issue with access to the trail back here. And so if they wanted to leave the guardrail, the other option would be treat it as if it's a hazard, provide proper shielding. That particular project, I think was limited access facility, had plenty of project space upstream of the hazard. So they could have extended the guardrail to the appropriate length of need and basically design it to meet SPI part B, which defines length of need. You could use the Excel design tool that we have set up. And the Excel design tool, our length of need, we're basically now just following roadside design guide equation 5.3. And so that's our policy in the FDOT. The second thing is that you want to meet this minimum setback at this location. So for general guardrail, we require five feet for FDM table 215.42. And so you back this up a little bit, still a vehicle wouldn't be able to fit back there. So it'd be successfully meeting their needs, but then also, you know, allow for this deflection of the guardrail. And so now moving into our final case study, we're under a bridge and the idea is to shield these bridge piers along here. Looks like this project places the guardrail possibly shoulder width plus two feet. So maybe eight foot shoulder plus two feet gives 10 feet. I think so the setback looks okay of the guardrail or the offset from the roadway looks okay. Our design assumptions for this one will say it's 50 miles per hour design speed. And then the piers are designed to withstand 600 kip impact load for FDM 215-454. And so the whole concept is that peer protection barrier is not required. We use peer protection barrier if the peers themselves cannot withstand impact from a semi-tractor trailer or TL5 load as defined in the LRFD. Basically, if they can't withstand the 600 kip load, that triggers the use of standard 521-002, which is TL5 barrier. But if that's not the case, we don't need peer protection barrier 
We still want to shield the peers to provide some degree of protection for the peers, but then also for the benefit of the vehicles themselves, because the peers would be considered a hazard. So in that case, you can use guardrail 536-001 or concrete barrier 521-001. And so those are the key differences between peer protection barrier and then standard barriers. So the idea is that guardrail is acceptable. The peers themselves can handle an impact from a large truck. So those are our basic assumptions. And then the question is, are there any issues here? And so looks like, okay, on the top, we got the traffic moving right to left. On the bottom, moving left to right. The designer called out an approach terminal on the approach side, which is good. Trailing anchorage is on the trailing side. And so that's also okay. As we mentioned, uh, the shoulder size looks okay. So are there any issues here? And the answer is yes. A pretty major issue, the piers are not considered shielded. The length of need is just certainly not met per SPI Part B, the Excel design tool. Typical runout length for 50 miles per hour that's used as the basis for the length of need design is around 200 feet for 50 miles per hour. And then that would be slightly shorter for a length of need given an angle of departure in the shoulder width. But still, if you starting point is 200 feet, you could see that this is just nowhere near that. It's only, you know, two and a half post spacings. And you would actually begin to measure length of need at post two. And so there's almost no length of need provided. And so that's an issue. The designer didn't really look at length of need calculations when placing this. The other issue is the piers are behind the gating, which is the breakaway portion of the approach terminal and that's located right here. And so as I was saying, you measure length of need starting at post two, you could expect that this portion of an approach terminal is simply breakaway. It's designed to just get out of the way and let a vehicle go through if it's hit from this angle. And so that's not gonna shield that pier. And so it is important to understand uh, some of the fundamental concepts about an approach terminal where it breaks away and that way you don't put a hazard right next to that. Second issue, as we know, flare terminals are on hold for roadside design bulletin 1802. And so we wouldn't be wanting to see any flare terminals proposed in, in new projects, regardless of whether or not flared is permitted. The taper rate is just too steep here. The approach terminal shows about a one to three. Even for approach terminals, the one to 10 and the one to 15 uh, needs to be abided by. And this is another case where we're not sure what the designer was looking at in terms of emulating a standard plans drawing or an APL drawing, please, in your designs, always try to follow an existing standard plans drawing or an existing APL drawing and not create shapes that really aren't considered crashworthy. And the third issue, this one might be a little bit harder to spot down here on the bottom of the screen, but the piers are a little bit closer to this guardrail on the bottom. And, you know, if you consider the post spacing six foot three, it's optical illusion, so it's a little hard to see, but you turn that vertical uh, looks like the piers are within five feet of the face of guardrail or it certainly would require some investigation because that's looking pretty close now and so potentially violates barrier setback per fdm table 215.42 basically you need five feet or greater with standard post spacing and there are remedies for that with reduced post spacing which you can see in that table uh, the fourth issue is that the trailing anchorage does not properly extend downstream of the hazard and so a fairly new requirement based on recent uh, crash testing, and they've done a report where they did some computer modeling, where they've proven that in order to successfully redirect a vehicle away from a hazard, the trailing anchorage needs to extend 25 feet, basically downstream of this bridge pier. And so that's shown in two places, SPI, part C1, and then also the length of need design tool. So. The design tool looks like this. It's oriented the opposite way of the drawing we just saw, but you can see you have the hazard. And then now we show 25 foot minimum extension. A vehicle coming right to left, if it hits you know, within 25 feet of the end, it's likely to pierce right through. So you need to have some uh, rigid posts here to develop this ribbon strength and allow for the vehicle to kind of be absorbed by guardrail and then redirected back out and not just punch right through. And so they've proven for uh, MASH vehicles, which are larger, you need this downstream extension right here. And so our first solution uh, would be using guardrail. 
uh, with a crash cushion. Unfortunately, with the very large uh, space constraints we have in this project, using typical uh, guardrail end treatments uh, just doesn't look like it would be feasible. And so the thing to start immediately considering when the lengthy end treatments for guardrail won't fit are crash cushions, which can be considerably shorter. We've had crash cushions as short as you know 17 and a half feet on our APL. And so those can certainly fit um, a lot easier than the 50 plus foot approach terminals. And then also you don't have to have the full length of need if you're able to basically wrap around the bridge pier and ensure that there's no route for the vehicle to impact the bridge pier. And so we have it set up in our CAD cell tables. We've recently redeveloped the CAD cell table to work along with the SPI where every variable uh, in that cell table is nicely defined and it explains to you how to use it. And so this would be an ideal candidate where you would define a system width as wide in order to provide enough space for the guardrail to wrap around the pier. You could have a, a 90 inch wide crash cushion. And so you would look in the APL drawings and see what are some of the widest crash cushions available at the point where they connect to guardrail and see if it's efficient. Hopefully a couple will be available that can do that. And then you'd set a system width requirement so that the contractor can only use the ones with the system width that you specify. And then the second thing is you would want to place a length restriction so you can look through basically the catalog and the APL, see that there are crash cushions that are going to fit your need and Hopefully there'll be two of them available so the contractor has a choice and then you define the length restriction and all these things go in the crash cushion table that's provided with the CAD bar menu. And then lastly, what's important too is if the design standards don't immediately fit, you may need some help with transitions of guardrail, things that are highly product specific, you can contact central office and we can help you through that. For the unique cases that the standards may not fit, we'd be happy to help. One other idea is on the back face here, you can reduce the post spacing and then that will decrease the amount of deflection that's required per FDM table 215.42. So here we're showing half post spacing and we've also decreased all the spacing and the approaches to the crash cushion themselves to provide a very limited uh, setback to this hazard here. And so again, contact central office for limited space scenarios we could help you with a project specific design. Another solution, which is even more low profile, takes up less space, is to use concrete barrier. We already have standards that show shielding of bridge piers very close in this way. It would basically just need an end face on it and then that can connect to crash cushion. And then that way it can handle holding the back fill or possibly pouring a cap on top. But for a case that's this uh, limited with available clear space, it does require project specific design but you can contact central office and we'll give you some guidance for that. And in uh, future standards, we look to add more and more options to handle more and more scenarios such as this. So be on the lookout for that. And with that, we're going to go ahead and close out the presentation. We appreciate your interest and attention. And if you have any questions, my contact information is here. It's also on our standard plans website. And so if you have any project specific concerns or unique questions, we'd be happy to hear that. Go ahead and send me an email and thank you for watching.